uh, like to introduce uh, our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Marina Harchenko. Marina uh, is a lawyer. Ma Marina is based in Cyprus and she's a member of a Cyprus Bar Association. Uh, Marina has been working in the field of uh, corporate services for over 11 years, both in Cyprus and overseas. Uh, Marina is the CEO of Prava Limited. Uh, Prava Limited is a corporate service provider in Cyprus. Uh, so today, uh, Marina will give us a general overview of powers and liabilities of the directors and what it means to third parties. Uh, just a small note that Marina will have to leave us at 5 p.m. Cyprus time as she's, she, she needs to attend a course on arbitration as she's training to become an arbitration lawyer too. So wishing her all the very best in uh, becoming an arbitration lawyer. I'm sure you'll make a great lawyer, Marina, arbitration lawyer. Um, and you're a great lawyer already. Uh, so should you have uh, any questions for Marina, uh, please type them in uh, Q&A tab. Uh, and Marina will try and type in answers once she leaves our event. Um, so let's proceed to Marina's presentation. Welcome, Marina. Right, thank you so much. Thank you, Alexandra, for great words. Thank you for the introduction, it was lovely. Pleasure to see you, pleasure to see all of you guys. Um, so happy Thursday to everyone. Let's begin with some presentation. Right. I'm going to I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start talking about the powers of the directors, the liabilities of the directors, um, the and we'll slowly uh, go into the articles of association and the shareholders agreement, which is the topic that I will discuss in depth on 20th of June. And well, I would like to welcome you all on the 20th of June and hope to see you there. Right. Just a second. Let me share the screen. OK. Okay, perfect. So um, I'll begin. Let's talk about the ultra-virus transactions at the beginning and some powers of the directors, their liabilities and what it means to third parties. Then we'll look at some duties. Okay, and at the end, I hope we have the time uh, to see whether powers of the directors that we will discuss today can be limited in any way uh, in order not to not to confront, not to have any issues with the management and control uh, of the company. Uh, I would like to say that I'm going to be talking about Cyprus companies and some uh, will make some reference to the case law studies, both in UK and Cyprus, because I know that a lot of clients and a lot of um, in business, but a lot of clients have businesses in, in Cyprus as well, and Cyprus com companies are widely used in the structuring. So I hope the information that I'm going to share today will be quite useful um, since, you know, we may speak about the group of companies as a whole where Cyprus companies are holding entities. Right. So what ultra-virus transactions mean to a third party. And for those of you who are not lawyers, you may wonder why we lawyers like using Latin phrases. Ultra-virus transactions mean that, that the transactions go beyond the scope um, of authority of the board of directors and beyond the powers given to them. And what does it mean when an outsider, when, when I talk about the outsider, it's a third party that makes an agreement with such, enters into agreement with such a company. What does these mean to a contractor of a company. I will start probably with um, with a very old case, which is Ferguson and Wilson in 1866 um, in UK. Of course, that's where you know the whole justice system was back in back in that century, uh, and and from that case we see that the company itself cannot act in its own person. It can only act through directors. So we see that there is a concept of agency. Um, where the company, yes, it's a separate legal entity, as we've seen in Solomon versus Solomon case. It's another old case um, that, that exists in UK um, common law. Um, but the director acts and represents the company in a way one agent would represent the principal. So in this way, the directors are safeguarded from being personally liable because company has a separate personality, 
but the director should act, act within their given authority, within their given powers. And we come to another great case, um, Haji Pablo case in 2000, more recent case, um, where it says that if the directors act in their representative capacity, any transaction will be binding on the company. Protection from a personal liability of a director is lost when directors undertook personal liability and contracted in their own name and where the company's name is incorrectly used. Also, CAP 113, it's the company's law in Cyprus, says that in this case, when you incorrectly, uh, you, uh, when you incorrectly use the company's name, uh, the director will have to pay a fine of 427 euros. That, that's a, a hell of a fine, right? Um, CAP 113 says, that the acts of a director shall be valid notwithstanding any defect that may afterwards be discovered in his appointment or qualification. So if you have a company, let's say, and the director was appointed, but you're missing, I don't know, a, a minor technical uh, resolution or um, any other irregularity to the, do to the uh, documents drafted during the appointment, but in any case, the director became the director and you've seen him on the certificate of the directors that then his appointment is not that big of an issue since he already started acting as a director and such irregularities should not be strictly taken into account. So uh, when we spoke about the directors and them being agents or representatives of the company. Um, let's look at the common law principles of agency, right? A principal, a company, may be bound by an agent's actions, director's actions, in the event that the agent in question had actual or apparent authority, right? So actual authority and in Cyprus, um, it's split into express authority and implied authority and apparent authority or ostensible authority as it's called, not that much of an info in, in, in Cyprus laws. Um, but anyway, let me explain to you what each of them means. So an express authority is given by express words. Um, they can be in oral or in writing. For example, where the director is duly authorized by the board, right? So we have a board of directors that, I don't know, consists of three, four, five individuals and they appoint expressly, you say, Hey, um, Ivanov, you'll be one of the directors, right? So that's an express uh, authority given to this person. Or by an implication, implied authority. What is an implied authority? Um, if this individual from the board of directors is called a CEO of the company or a managing director, uh, then an outsider, a third party that signs an agreement with this individual would think that um, you know a CEO of a company may sign all and any documents. So he has an implied authority just by the nature of being a CEO of the company or a managing director to sign and enter into such agreements. Um, and an apparent authority in Cyprus um, in contracts law actually being mentioned only when we talk about exceeding the authority. Um, I remember one of the cases we, we've learned that the law school, it, it had to do with the bus drivers, right? So the company, there was a transport company and there were bus drivers that would drive people from the point A to point Z, uh, Lineopetri case, I think. So the bus drivers would collect money from the passengers and then the company, it, it, they probably didn't give this money to the company. So the company came to the passengers themselves and stated that, you know, we didn't get any money. So um, give us the money for the tickets that you've got. Um, and it was held that no, uh, the company cannot demand that from a third party, from an outsider, because they thought that the bus drivers had an apparent authority to take money for the tickets to bring them from the point A to point B. When the transactions with the outsiders are uh, valid, right? So we need to look at two issues, whether the acts done by the organs of the company, by the board of directors are binding if such acts are not within the parameters of the company's objects or within the parameters of the company's objects. Company's objects are mentioned in the memorandum. 
and whether those representing the company have the authority to enter into a contract. The transaction that is technically ultra virus, um, the company would not be automatically void. Um, a company shall be bound towards third parties by transactions of its officers, even if such acts and transactions do not fall within the objects of the company, unless, of course, we, we always say that the third party acted in good faith, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it states that the third party is supposed to read publicly available documents, right? And what are the publicly available documents? Articles of association. In the, in the articles of association, we can see what powers the director has. So another uh, thing that the CAP 113 states is that the publication of the articles and of the memorandum of the company does not on itself amount to sufficient proof of knowledge on behalf of the third person. So even if an outsider read the articles of association of the company, no, does not necessarily mean that he is aware of all the dealings, of all uh, the regulations and policies the company may have. And more than that, um, it, there is a turnquad rule that says that persons dealing with the company are bound to read the public documents. In our case, it, it is in a way articles of association. Um, it's not that public, but anyway. Uh, and to see that the proposed dealing is not consistent therewith. But they're not bound to do more. So the third party does not have to do more. They do not need to inquire um, any internal proceedings. They do not need to ask any internal policies or other internal documents thereof. Exceptions to this rule. A third party would only be favored if he acted in good faith. That's always the case, right? A third party was an insider and he knew this information somehow that, you know, um, uh, this person is not allowed to enter its contract. Um, the third party knew that the document he's gonna sign is in fact forgery. Or um, a third party had to do investigation and didn't. That applies usually to the banks, and there is a case law, I don't recall now which one, but uh, a bank, if he's suspected to do an investigation, he should investigate the matters properly. Right, so let's move on to the second part um, and overview the duties and liabilities of the directors. The director, first of all, has fiduciary duties, they're of equitable nature, uh, stating that directors are kind of a quasi trustees of the company's assets, right? And we have common law duties of skill and care that go along with the principles of the law of the negligence. Um, I would like to think for a second to whom the duties are owed, to whom the duties of the director are owed. Are they owned to the company, to the shareholders, to the employees, to the creditors, to whom? So if we look, let's let's take it one by one. If we talk about the company, the duties are owed to a company as a whole, as an instrument. Um, again, the Solomon case comes to us and says that the company is a separate legal personality, so the director owes the duty to the company. But what if director is a sole director? Like to, to whom physically he owes these duties? Is it really that separate? you know, from the concept. Um, a lot of comments around and different cases. So, but they conclude in a way that the interests are owed to the company as a whole. To the shareholders, yes, but not collectively, oh, not individually, collectively, I'm sorry. To the shareholders as an organ, as a whole, yes, but not individually to each and every shareholder. The director is supposed to safeguard the members investments and the potential of sharing the profits. Um, also, there is a case that says that the directors have but one master, the company, not the shareholders. Always keep that in mind. Um, are the duties owed to the employees? No, not really. No, the director doesn't owe any duties to the employees unless we look at the concept of promoting of the company's success, then yes. Are the duties owed to the creditors? Again, not individually, but rather to a body of creditors, especially when the company is insolvent. The nature and the extent of director's obligation. So there are fiduciary duties acting in good faith and for the benefit of the company. 
the duty to exercise powers for a proper purpose, duty of care and skill, duty to avoid a conflict of interest. All of these are duties and obligations towards the company. You remember we, we've discussed to whom the duties are owed and the first answer was to the company as a whole. So let's look at the fiduciary duties that's acting in good faith and the um, care and skill, especially very important duty of um, care and skill um, because the directors need to provide the high standard of, of conduct. They need to be knowledgeable. They need to, be, they need to have some skills and experience in order to um, handle the affairs of the company. And the duty to avoid conflict of interest especially this duty is extremely important, especially it's more important when we talk about nominee directors. Um, the directors should be given the duty to not restrict their freedom to exercise the discretion. So the directors should have the discretion to act in a way that they think would fit the company's um, affairs and, and business. They have duty not to secure personal gain they have a duty not to become a director in a competing company, right? And in general, not to enter into any transactions where the director may have a personal interest. What are the remedies? What can we ask from a director that, that breached all of these duties? We can ask an injunction against him to stop him doing what he's doing if it's not you know, um, in the favor of the company and claim for compensation from the director personally. Yeah, but who can who can who can actually do that? Um, a company as 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 a body, but if it's a sole director, then again, there are some uh, there are some issues there. The answer in the case law is that the company itself and sometimes the shareholders can initiate the claim against the director. The director also has statutory obligations, maintaining books and of accounts, uh, preparing uh, financial. Preparing, preparing a director's report and you know uh, submitting financial statements and all that together with secretaries as a body in general. Um, duty to declare interest in contract with the company and general in general they have a duty to make the disclosure about the transactions, especially if it involves a personal interest. And another um, thing here that I would like to ask is that. I would like to think of a concept of a nominee director. Um, nominee directors have some kind of a dilemma because the nominee director is supposed to represent the interests of the shareholder. And then we have seen that the directors have all of these duties towards the company. But the nominee director, by representing the investor shareholder, by representing one of the shareholders, are still expected to act in the best interest of the company and not in the interest of his appointing shareholder. Such nominee director still has duty of care, skills are required, he still should be diligent to the company. And if the director, um, a nominee director or any director uh, is a director of a subsidiary, then you need to understand there is a potential conflict um, as to what interests we should protect, the interests of the group or the interests of the individual company. Um, and it was said that the primary duty is to represent the interest of his company where he is acting as a director and not group as a whole. And let's discuss this one. Um, this is the last point in my presentation. Can powers of the directors be limited in a way that we keep the management to control with the board of directors considering all of these powers that we have given to, to the board? Um, and that's, that's the question you know, that uh, my clients uh, come and ask me. Um, first of all, I would like to say that if the company has several documents, employment agreements, um, articles of association, um, I don't know, uh, some option agreement or, or any other agreements where the duties of the directors are stated, they need to be um, transferred to the articles of association. They need to reflect the same information um, and not to have too many discrepancies because then there are, there are other issues that arise. Right? And especially if we talk about reserved matters, 
where the shareholder, where the company may say that the director is allowed to sign um, all enter into any contract, but which do not exceed 50,000 euros, let's say. Above 50,000 euros, you will need the uh, resolution signed by the shareholders. So that's one of the things that may be included in the reserved matters. Um, unfortunately, I've seen that the clients tend to um, put variations of reserved matters in different documents. Well, you, should, you shouldn't you shouldn't do that uh, that way. Um, you should keep it uh, transparent and transfer them to the Articles of Association. Because if we go back and, and think that the third party is supposed to read the public document, but is not supposed to read any other internal document, how would the third party know that powers of the directors are limited? Right? You don't want the director running around and signing with the third party some agreements that he was not authorized to do so because the company will be bound by these actions despite the fact that he went above and beyond the scopes given. It's very difficult then to prove whose fault it was and run after the director and claim some things from him and, and put the start the injunction orders against him. Um, so yeah, that, that's my advice, if I may, to have it in all the documents written down and put some procedural safeguards. Um, I don't know, for example, state in the Articles of Association that the resolution of the shareholders uh, must be signed if the director has um, a personal gain or interest. Uh, you should consider, I don't know, asking the director to sign the disclosure where he has an interest or where he acts as a director. The employment agreement needs to be in line with all the other documents that we have discussed. Um, so yeah, that, that's to sum up. And I think everything that we write uh, in the articles, it's, you know, the third party, since the third party is protected, maybe it's more of an instrument to, um, to ask the director to act within the powers given and such powers should be stated in all the documents. Right. Uh, so um, that's that's it for now. I'm going to be happy to ask any any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. Just a really, really quick question. I know you, you've done beautifully fitting your presentation into 20 minutes we have. Uh, but um, just a really quick question, like what you talked about is, uh, is so useful, but how long in your experience does it take to draft a good memorandum and articles of association? And also just a really quick one, let's say, how yeah. should a client approach uh, a lawyer with right. such stuff? Yeah, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a very good question, Alexandra, thank you. Um, I think the client should approach the lawyer disclosing all the facts. Um, I've seen it sometimes that the clients um, come to a lawyer and they are like, okay, can you amend the articles of association? We just need a couple of reserved matters to be entered here, to be entered there. And when you start working with the articles, you find out that there are other documents that state different facts. Um, and, and you're trying to explain to the client that the articles should contain those provisions as well. And there are ways to uh, transpose them to the articles. Um, so I think the client should come to the lawyer disclosing um, all the things that and the situation as is. Um, and the drafting should be done um, two, three weeks. I, I think should be enough. Um, it shouldn't take much more than that. But less than that, I would, I would say it's not a, a, a proper detailed job as such. Um, but in any case, we were going to talk about shareholders of uh, shareholders agreement and the articles of association on 20th of June. Um, I will not touch the subject on the directors, uh, the board of directors of the company, but it, we will look in detail on how to draft both and how to uh, mix and match all the advantages that we want. All right. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Marina.